Hi, thanks for watching this video where I'm going to talk you through baseline testing. My name's Nick Dudley and I'm a physicist and I've been working in ultrasound for over 40 years, almost half of that time with a clinical role. I've always had an interest in quality assurance, both of the equipment and the imaging process. Baseline testing sets tolerances for future testing. If you can do this with the acceptance testing, you're going to save a bit of time because some of the setup is the same. If you've got some phantoms, you're going to set baselines for annual tests using those. If you haven't got phantoms, you'll just be setting baselines for user tests and some very simple annual tests. Setup for user tests is very similar to the uniformity testing at acceptance. The setup process for phased arrays is slightly different for linear and curved arrays, but I'll describe the differences as we go along. We're going to use the in-air reverberation again, but this time to assess sensitivity. Remember this pattern's created by the ultrasound bouncing back and forth in the lens, so we need the lens to be clean and dry with no gel on it. Now if the sensitivity of the scanner or the probe changes, we might expect the number of reverberations to change, so maybe the weaker reverberations will disappear. Now something to bear in mind when you're doing this test is the lens is affected by temperature, so you might see some variation from one occasion to another, but this will be accounted for by tolerances set on the test results. Now I'm turning off the controls that might mask non-uniformities, so compounding, advanced processing, automatic gain and automatic image optimization that might work against me when I alter other controls. I'm interested in the depth of in-air reverberation, so I'm adjusting scale to magnify this area to 20 to 50% of the display without losing the ends of the probe. For phased arrays, the starting point should be a scale of at least 10 centimetres to make sure that all the elements are active. Now I'm moving the focus upwards. This reduces the number of elements firing at one time, so we have a better chance of seeing any dead elements. For phased arrays, this will probably deactivate 50% of the array, so the starting point for phased arrays is a focal depth of at least 5 centimetres to make sure the whole array is active. Now we're at the key point of this process. The sensitivity assessment uses a measurement of the deepest reverberation depth. I apply the rule, if you can see it, measure it. If you can clearly identify the deepest reverberation, these are the correct settings. The question I ask myself at this point is, would someone else identify the deepest reverberation at a different point? If I'm not sure, I change the settings until I get an unequivocal image. The adjustment involves toggling the frequencies and tweaking the gain until you get an unequivocal image where you think anyone else would make the same measurement. Having found the correct settings, it's then important to ensure there's some noise in the image with maximum overall gain. This might mean increasing the scale setting until noise appears. Occasionally this doesn't show any noise, and I would then increase the TGC to maximum and repeat the whole process. The user QA settings have now been found, the frequency and gain that gave an unequivocal deepest reverberation, and the scale that showed distal noise at maximum gain. I save these as a preset at this point, with the probe identified in the name. Having got the settings, we can now do some measurements. The sensitivity assessment is in two parts. A vertical measurement from the probe surface to the deepest visible reverberation line in the middle third of the image. The tolerance is half the distance to the adjacent reverberation plane. For the second part, the overall gain is turned down to the point where the deepest reverberation line disappears. I call this the reverberation threshold. I tend to repeat this until I'm confident I have the correct value. There's also a noise threshold measurement, where overall gain is adjusted to the point where all noise in the distal image disappears. Again, I tend to repeat this until I'm confident I have the correct value. These threshold gains should be recorded with tolerances of plus or minus four gain increments. As pulsed and colour Doppler are processed in separate channels to B mode, we need separate noise thresholds. For pulse Doppler, this is done with the range gate centrally and for colour with the colour box at the bottom of the image for consistency. Then the gain is increased to see noise and reduced again until the noise is just eliminated. 
If you have a phantom, you should make sensitivity measurements and take images of the targets available in the phantom. I'd recommend a phantom with speed of sound 1540 meters per second, as many scanners now have speed of sound correction controls and it's difficult to demonstrate performance anomalies if the phantom speed of sound is non-standard. These tests should use a preset appropriate to the probe that gives a uniform image of the test object. It's important to record all displayed settings or save a new preset after adjustment as the settings for future testing should be the same. To get the maximum sensitivity, output should be 100%. Use mid-range TGC to keep it simple. Automatic image optimization and speed of sound correction should be turned off as they might mask future faults. Penetration depth is the depth where speckle disappears, so the image scale should be set to show this with a bit of leeway, maybe 10%. The assessment of penetration is easiest with a real-time image. We're looking for the depth where the speckle stops being clearly visible across the width of the image. We measure from the top of the image to this depth. This is quite subjective, so if you have some software to do it, you'll get a more reproducible result. An alternative is to measure the mean grey level in the image, which is very straightforward with free software like ImageJ. It's worth storing images of all the target sets in your Phantom for visual comparison in case you suspect a fault. Phantoms come with a variety of targets, always some nylon filaments and often some cystic and grayscale targets. To summarise, these are the tests that give you the results and images that you'll need for comparison for future testing and if you suspect a fault when you're scanning. You'll have a preset for user testing this allows you to spot dropout and other non-uniformities and make an assessment of sensitivity and noise. If you have a phantom, you've also got some clinically relevant sensitivity measurements and some images that you can use for comparison if you suspect a fault.